What's the word, y'all? I just recorded this entire video and forgot to turn on the microphone. So let's, let's try to replicate all the energy and all the great stuff. There's nothing I could say about Victor Wimbayama that hasn't been said before, right? He is a generational talent. He's already doing some crazy stuff. He's a multi-time all-star, multi-time DPOY in the future if everything goes perfectly. The other day, I saw a clip on Twitter where it was Ramona Shelburne, Malika Andrews, Danny Green, and Kendrick Perkins talking about Victor Wimbayama and the pressure that is on the San Antonio Spurs to flip the switch and make a competitive team around him immediately or he might be the first player to take the qualifying offer and walk away from a team without a max extension, which again is a huge, huge stretch. I disagree with that completely, but that was a conversation that was going on. And that clip was earlier in the week and it's been on my mind and I couldn't figure out exactly what I felt about it until it finally clicked. Is there pressure? Sure. Anytime you have a guy as good as Victor Wembanyama, you want to take advantage of the, the, the days, the years that you have with him. So sure, but I don't think it's to that extent. So us NBA fans are always trying to figure out what the next trade is, right? And with the Atlanta Hawks struggling as they did with DeJounte Murray and Trey Young as a backcourt, there's been a lot of rumors about the Spurs potentially wanting to do in on the Trey Young deal. And there's there's no base in that right now. It's just NBA fans saying, oh, the, the Atlanta Hawks haven't been very good. Maybe it's time for Trey Young to be traded, right? And I never really knew if I loved the idea or or not of pairing Trey Young with Victor Wimbanyama. The reason to love it is like, hey, you can tell that Victor Wimbanyama in, is in himself is as dominant as the players you could potentially get eventually, right? Right now, only thing you really need to know is the efficiency differential teams, points scored per 100 possessions minus the team points allowed. Like he is a ridiculous defender. You can argue that he's the most impactful defender in basketball already. He's not even 20 years old, right? And there's no there's no surprise that the moment they decide to play Trey Young and Victor Wembanyama together a lot, the team actually looks like an adequate NBA team. The there are plus. 4.32 net rating when they're together, when they're both off, it's awful. When it's just Wimby without Trey Jones, it's awful. And when it's just Trey Jones without Wimby, it's awful. And if you add them of a sale to that mixture, this is a real lineup. Like those three are, that's real. So the idea is like, hey, can you see, you see his numbers with Trey Jones, who's solid, but imagine if he had Trey Young. And Trey Young has become a better defender nowadays, but he having Victor Wimbyama on his backside is like the perfect match. And I understand that. But part of me never really clicked with it. And I think I know the reason why now. And I'll never be able to tell R.C. Buford or uh, Greg Popovich how to run a team. They got more rings than, you know what I'm saying. Um, but part of me would rather them steer on the side of patience. And, and one of the main reasons I say that is the Luka Doncic dilemma, right? Luka Doncic came into the NBA as one of the best. These ads are so weird. One of the best players. He won rookie of the year. He averaged 21, 6, and 8. And in his rookie season, the Dallas Mavericks won 33 games, 33 and 49. They missed the playoffs. Luka was so damn good that in year number two, they went from out the playoffs to being in the first round versus the Clippers. And then they went another first round versus the Clippers. And then they went to the conference finals. Last year, they missed it completely. And this year, they're a playoff team at the moment. We'll see if they actually make it. But because Luka Doncic was so good from the start, they couldn't rebuild their team traditionally. And a traditional rebuild is be bad for multiple seasons. You end up with a top five pick. Maybe that's a player you build around. You have multiple years after that of drafting pieces to pair with the guy. Because Luka was so good, they only had one more year really in the lottery until they got Derek Lively this year. And that is why the Dallas Mavericks have struggled to really build around Luka. It's because it can't happen organically. You have to give up assets. Right now, they basically traded every first round pick until 2030 plus. And the team that they have is the eighth seed. Because Luka is so good that he can't allow you to miss the playoffs. And now look at OKC. And OKC is not the perfect one-to-one -one comparison, but please bear with me as I try to break this down. Shea Gilles Alexander got traded to the OKC Thunder, and in his very first season, him and Chris Paul, the company, surprised the world. They had the 32, uh, plus, uh, 32 and a half over under. They end up winning 44 games. They get to the bubble. They lose. Shout out to Lou Dorf for his game seven, but also shout out to Harden for the block in game seven. They immediately are really good. Now, part of that is Chris Paul and company, whatever. But in this season... Now, it was a very well-orchestrated team, a very balanced team, one of my favorite teams to watch now that I think about it. Um, but Shea was the, was the leading scorer in his roster, and he was only 21 years old. And if you go back and, and look at a lot of the predictions, now, people didn't predict that Shea was going to be a goddamn MVP one day, but most people recognize that Shea is a multiple-time All-Star in the making, an All-NBA player in the making, right? OKC trades away Chris Paul or whatever, and they decide to stay patient. Remember the first couple years after Chris Paul got traded and there was so much conversations about maybe Shea Gilders Alexander won and out because they had multiple years of them being really, really bad with him. He's too good of a talent for him to be sitting on this roster that's winning 22 games. Shea shut all of that down. 
But the conversation was Shea was so good. Why doesn't OKC go out and build a team around him by using some of the assets they have? So the first year after Chris Paul and company are gone, they win 22 games, right? Wow, 22 and 50. It was a lot of L's. And in this season, this is one of the seasons where Shea gets shut down. He has some injuries and stuff. Only 33 games or uh, 35 games. But because they lost this, that ends up getting them. I'm pretty sure this is Josh Giddy's rookie season. Yeah, so they get Josh Giddy. They also get like Trey Mann and stuff who they eventually flip for some of the stuff they have now. But because they were bad that season, they got Josh Giddy. And because they were bad again, and they didn't throw fuel to the fire, that ends up getting them Chet Holmgren. Now, Chet did not play this season. Obviously, this is his first real rookie season, but they end up getting Chet. So if they would have just added fuel to the fire instead of being patient, then Chet is not on this roster. J-Dub is because I'm pretty sure J-Dub's a part of the original Paul George trade and that pick came from the Clippers. But like you don't get Chet and Giddy maybe not be a part of the long-term future, but they have a genuine big three in the making right now. But if they decided to throw fuel to the fire on Shea when he was as good to make, like, like he was make, good enough to make all-star games but wasn't making it because the team was 22 and 50, if they would add a fuel to that fire, then they don't have Chet right now. And that's part of the thinking I have with the Spurs. Now again, Victor Wibanyama might be so very good that they go from a team that might win 15 games this year to next year they're already in the 30s to 40s. It's possible. It's possible. But maybe not. And maybe use the, the first round pick you get this year and it's Nikola Topic, Topic. I don't know the prospects, but it's one of the guys that you can help build with him and Devin Vassell because I see those two as kind of a pair. I love Devin Vassell's game, especially in the last couple months. And then maybe you have another year Will you get another top five pick? Now, the thing about the Spurs is that they own a Toronto Raptors pick and the Raptors right now have the seventh best record in basketball. So they might get that pick and it might be seven through whatever. Um, they also get the Charlotte Hornets pick. The, the Hornets are keeping that when they have their own. They have a Bulls top 10 protector for next year. Who knows what the Bulls are doing this offseason? They have the Atlanta Hawks pick, no protection. So there is a world where both of these two things can coexist, where they can go get a Trey Young. And because they have a Charlotte pick that might convey eventually, and they have an Atlanta Hawks pick, which I'm assuming Atlanta would want their own picks back in a potential trade, that they could make both things happen at the same time. But the last thing I want them to do is to go out there and make some adjustments, make some trades for the now and it hinders them from really really finding the co-star for uh victor wibanyama that's all i don't even know if i said anything but i th that that clip of esp has just been in my mind in my mind in my mind and i wanted to make a video about it let me know what you think should they be patient should they try to go get a trey young should they try to go get somebody else i know trey young is the one that a lot of us are rumored to think about but there might be other people on the market come uh after the playoffs you know things happen but but you know